Welcome to the NAES Copy Cataloging Refresher. This course was put together by Mary Russell in December of 2022. Let's start with a definition. What is copy cataloging? Copy cataloging means adapting, and adapting is very important. We'll get more on that later. Adapting for local use, a catalog, a copy of the original cataloging created by another library. So what is cataloging? Cataloging has a lot of different pieces that go into it. A cataloging record describes a specific bibliographic manifestation of an intellectual work. That might be a movie, it might be a book, it might be uh, an issue of a magazine, it could be any number of things. Um, the details of cataloging, the punctuation, what information you need to include, where you get that information from of a cataloging record are determined by a cataloging standard. AACR2 and RDA are examples of cataloging standards. Where the specific piece of information goes, any specific piece of information goes in the record, and what codes and indicators mean is determined by the record format, mark, for example. All of those things are parts of cataloging. Descriptive cataloging is the whatness of a thing that's being cataloged. What is it called? Who created it? How big is it? What physical features does it have? Does it have pictures? Is it in a ring binder? Is it fuzzy? Stuff like that. What language is it written in? Um, and does it have other manifestations? Like, can you also get this thing in microform or as an ebook? Those are all elements of the whatness of the thing and fall under the category of descriptive cataloging. Subject cataloging, on the other hand, is the aboutness of the thing that is being cataloged. So it's the subject matter rather than the physical thing. Um, all subject headings fall under the heading of subject cataloging. And notes about the intellectual content of the item, like the summary of the plot or a table of contents, are part of subject cataloging as well. Links to related works, um, for example, this is part of a series, this is a concordance to the Bible, stuff like that also is subject cataloging. Item level cataloging is essentially inventory control. It's how a library knows what it actually has in its collection. How many copies are there? Where is each copy kept? So your call number is part of item level cataloging. Um, the collection or location designation or code, this is part of the children's collection, this is part of the New Hampshire collection. Those kinds of things are item level information. Um, and what, if anything, is special about a specific copy? For example, is it signed by the author? All of those pieces make up what we call item level cataloging. Cataloging overall is all of those things I've just covered. And when somebody says cataloging, they may mean any or all of those pieces. But copy cataloging, you may recall from a moment ago, is where we adapt an existing cataloging record for local use. Um, so if you, there are lots of resources to learn a lot more about all of these different definitions and elements um, at the website indicated here. We anticipate it being in an HSL LibGuide shortly. Um, so if you don't find that resource there, check out the LibGuides. Um, and you will also find information um, on the nays.blogspot.com site about a variety of cataloging related topics and a link at the top right hand side to the form you can use to request records and information about obtaining new pack records if you are a New Hampshire library. So let's go through 10 tips for better copy cataloging in your library. First, Always check your own catalog thoroughly before you bring in a new record. Duplicate records are confusing and unnecessary. Never go to an outside source before you make sure that there's not already a record in your own local catalog. And that might be just for your library or it might be for your consortium, uh, depending on where you are. Number two, 
use as few different sources of records as possible for the sake of consistency. There are thousands of places out in the world where you could get cataloging records. Um, and if you if everyone who works in your library gets them from different places or if every time you sit down to catalog something, you go to a different source, for example, a different Z3950 target, uh, some other library's catalog, your records are going to be very inconsistent because everybody does things a little bit differently and you're going to have a lot more just confusion than you need. So you should have a list of sources in order of preference that everyone in your library uses to get their copy cataloging. It'll make your records more consistent and it'll make it easier for people to catalog because they won't have to guess where they should maybe look. I would strongly recommend New Hampshire libraries have the new pack as their primary source because that is a free source of cataloging records. Um, but you may have things you don't find there. Um, you can have as a second choice that you put in a request to have us find you a record here in Nays, but if you'd prefer, you can also have a second option of going to, for example, the Library of Congress or any of a number of Z3950 targets that your local system vendor may promote. Number three, search carefully and thoroughly to be sure you find the best record. There should, the record should always have been created by the chief source of information. I can't guarantee that that is what you're going to find out in the wilds of cataloging, but that is what should have happened. For example, the title of a book should be what's on the title page, not what's on the cover. So as you're trying to make sure that you have the matching record to your item in hand, you need to be aware of where the data should have come from. So the title on the cover, if it's different than your record, it may still be the right record because you need to match the title page. Um, you should probably try more than one type of search before deciding that a record doesn't exist or before accepting a record that's not really very complete or helpful. Um, an author or a standard number search might bring up a record that has a typo in the title, and so which you did not get. Um, but you can still use that record because you can fix the typo because remember you're adapting somebody else's cataloging record to your system. Series are very likely to have um, titles that are entered differently by different people. Um, so that is another area where you should make sure you've searched thoroughly before you decide on the record that you're going to use. A cover image alone, especially in the new pack, but this is true across any Z3950 target. Um, you shouldn't let a cover image convince you you found a match. Check the title page info and the physical description. Does it have the right number of pages? Is it the right kind of thing? Um, the way that cover images are generated in catalogs is strictly based on an ISBN. So it's really easy to have a, catalog, a cover display that is not for the book the record is for, because it's one digit off in your ISBN and then you have the wrong cover showing. So don't count on that. Make sure you double check your details. Number four, make sure you're using a record that is for the same kind of material as your object. A record for a video is not the same as a record for a book. A record for a map may not be the same as a record for a book or a computer file. Um, to, term, to determine the appropriate format, you're going to be looking at both the type indications and the bib level indications for the material that you are cataloging. Between those two, they characterize the kind of material represented by the record. I am not going to go into detail about what all of this is or how it all works or what it means, but I have given you at the bottom of the slide here um, a URL for OCLC bib formats and standards explanation of fixed fields. I strongly encourage you to read it. Um, it explains the whole complicated system of what these things are and how they match up and um, it will give you an overview of what you're looking for and it is also something to bookmark because when you're faced with a, a particular coding that you've not come across before, it will interpret it for you and tell you what it is that that means, that it has a, a J type and a D bib level. So you wouldn't rem the, you would not memorize all of this stuff. You would have a reference to tell you. 
Number five, be consistent in your use of tags. Following the national standards will serve you the best. If you put every note in a 500 tag, it is not going to be as useful for your patrons as if you put notes in the fields where they belong. For example, a, title of con a table of contents or a grant funding note have particular tags that they belong in. If you put the things in the tags they go in, then you'll be able to search for them using specialized indexes. So for example, you could search for grant funding information with an index that is built against that note field in your local system. And if you think, well, my local system doesn't have those things, it probably could. So there is no reason to not build the records for some future scenario where you might set up those specialized indexes. Number six, delete the parts of the records that do not serve your patrons. Remember, you are making a copy of somebody else's record and putting it in your own system. So you can remove things from that record that are not going to be useful to your patrons. Some examples might include Canadian subject headings. If you are not in Canada, your patrons probably are not using the Canadian headings. Uh, the Library of Congress is very keen on putting notes in the records on OCLC about their digitizing decisions and their retention decisions. Those do not make any difference to your library because they're not your decisions. The classification numbers that you don't use, like Library of Congress classification or National Library of Medicine, there's no reason for those to be in your records. That will just confuse your patrons who are trying to figure out where this thing is. The Dewey number in the 092 tag also might be something you'll want to delete out of the record if you locally have chosen to use a different number. Uh, that number is put in there as, an indic as a, a helper. It could also be in the 082, depending on your source. Um, but the Dewey number, if you didn't use that Dewey number, it just confuses your patrons to have two different numbers on the record because they may not realize that the one in the item is really the one they want. They see a Dewey number and they figure that's it. So if you used a different one, you should remove the one from the bib record out of your catalog. However, related to that, number seven, don't delete things just because you don't know what they are. Some of the things that appear to be complete gobbledygook are actually incredibly important for your local system to be able to sort and filter um, and search by facets. So definitely be sure you know what you're getting rid of before you get rid of it. Your cataloging authority is going to tell you what everything is so you know what you're deleting. And if you have no idea what your cataloging authority is, it's probably... Uh, the OCLC bib formats and standards. It might be the Library of Congress site, but it is some source that defines all of the tags in your system. All new pack records are based on OCLC records. So consequently, OCLC bib formats and standards is the definition of all the different fields that are in those records. So if you're looking at and going, well, what is an O33 and do I need that? You can go to bib formats and standards, look it up, see what it is, decide whether it is in fact a thing that you need in your library record. But if you're not sure, leave it be. Number eight, add information to your records that will help your patrons. I, I have mentioned it before and I will say it again. These are your local records. You are de designing them to help your patrons in your community. So you don't have to, to conform to what will be useful for the Library of Congress or what might be useful to a library in Paris. You need to worry about what will help your patrons. Um, so if there are special rules for using an item, you should put that in the record. That will be useful to your patron, like knowing they need to, to sign a waiver to borrow a robot. Do you have other items that go with this thing? Um, perhaps on your astronomy book record, you want to mention that you guys lend a telescope and that they can see the information about the telescope over at this other record. Um, or is there something that's specific about this book in your community? Is it by a, someone who lives in town? Is it a cookbook of the local um, ladies auxiliary for a church? Something like that. Um, it might be something that you want to specify that wouldn't necessarily be in the national record because it won't matter to everybody, but it matters to your patrons potentially. So add that data in the fields where it belongs. 
Proofread your records. It is astounding how many records have weird typos in them that if somebody had just looked closely, probably wouldn't be there. Just because the rec it's in a record doesn't mean it's correct. Compare the details to your item in hand. Um, there are typos in cataloging records that don't reflect the title page. Sometimes there are typos that do reflect the title page and those should be left there. But you can certainly make a note that says, you know, the title page misspelled the word received so that people know like that's why that's like that. Um, so yours and other people's typos. Try not double check your records when you finished with them to make sure you didn't add any new mistakes. Um, and but also don't assume just because it's there that it isn't a typo. There is a list of the most common typos found in library databases at the URL on the slide. And it was an extremely eye opening experience during COVID when the state library staff um, started spending some time working through these typos in our own local catalog. So the state library's catalog, not the union catalog. Um, there were an astounding number of them that I would have thought we had a really clean catalog and I was wrong. So it is definitely worth taking a look. These are sorted by how frequently you're likely to find them. Um, but, you know, take a look at the list, pick out a couple that that you think might be relevant to your collections and do a search and see how many times those typos show up in your catalog and fix them as you go along. The last tip is to relax. You are copy cataloging. Anything you do to a copy of a record can be undone. And if you make a complete hash of the thing, you can always go back and get another copy from your original source. So whatever you're doing, it's okay. You can undo it if it's a disaster. It will all be fine. Don't forget to breathe. It's just copy cataloging. Okay, the, what is the single most important thing a library can do to improve the quality of its catalog? You can develop a local cataloging policy. One of the things that makes a catalog the most useful is consistency. So the same things are identified the same way every time. Your library needs a local cataloging policy because, as I said, it is the key to a consistent and usable catalog. It saves time and stress for everyone who does cataloging in your library, both the regular cataloger who does it all day long every day, if you are lucky enough to have someone like that, or the director who has to catalog this thing because a trustee is standing there waiting for it and hasn't cataloged since they were in library school 30 years ago. And the new person who just came to join your staff and needs to learn how all of your stuff works. It is an invaluable tool for training new staff and it helps public service staff who probably never catalog how to explain and to understand what is in the catalog. Some of the things deep in the MARC records can be useful, but only if you know what they are. And a cataloging policy will help them to understand this is how our library uses this. You're going to find these kinds of things in the catalog and this is what they're telling you. In order to create a local cataloging policy, um, we have put together a handout, which you will find on the website, um, of 11 cataloging questions. If you answer all of these questions, and the handout gives a bunch more detail um, on all of these things of exactly what we're talking about and what you need to consider, if you answer each of these 11 questions, you are going to have a pretty solid draft of a cataloging policy that you can start working from. Um, and then modify as you go along, if you need to. If you have questions about any of the material that was presented here, please contact the NAES Help Desk. This is our telephone number and our email address. You can also look at the NAES uh, website, which I mentioned previously in earlier slides, and there are resources there on cataloging as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention.